Hey guys, Desolator Magic here, and the drama will not stop when it comes to Guild of Ravnica Mythic Edition. So I wanted to make a follow-up video, there's a couple more details, and mostly some very entertaining conspiracy theories. Because there's one question left on everybody's mind, and I would say very reasonably. How did this product come about, and why was it released the way it was? And nobody has a true answer for that, but boy are some of the theories entertaining. But first, something even more entertaining. I picked up this little gem of information while Kevin was on a live stream today. That's uh, Kevin from Rogue Deck Builder, by the way, an endless source of entertainment. Now, I never said accurate information. I said entertainment. There's a difference. He said that the number one build around card, the biggest threat that everybody has to keep in mind in standard right now, and just get one, get one in your head because I guarantee it's not going to be the one he said. Also, make sure you're not eating or drinking right now. You might choke and die. It's Lyra Dawnbringer from Dominaria. And okay, it's $18, but who says any of that price is even from Standard? And yeah, it was in some decks at the stupid Star City Games Open or whatever where they try to determine the meta and just mislead people. I mean, seriously, let's use uh, my favorite example here. If you were to go by a recent Star City Games Open, I mean, it was a bit ago, um, the best deck in Standard is Red White Vehicles. And then like a week later at the Pro Tour, it was not. Gee, it's almost like you can't really make accurate determinations about the meta and people just bring some gimmicky jank that people will later build around because it'll be seen as the number one threat. It's almost like that's like a recurring pattern or something. Hmm. So to say, oh no, it's Lyra. Okay, let, let's break down Lyra. Let's take a look at her for a second. So after the release, okay, April to May, she was like 30 bucks. Then she went down. Going into June, she went down. And then after that, in July, she went down. And then she stayed down. And that's it. Little tiny bit of like a $2 price bump lately, but I mean, a new set came out, duh. Gee, we lost four sets and a Mythic from Dominaria went up. I'm shocked. I'm sure it's the only one. So the build around card costs five mana, which is, you know, on the border of, of playability. You know, six would be like, okay, that better really fit in the deck. But five is like, that's eh, expensive, but okay. So it's flying first strike lifelink has absolutely zero self-protection, zero evasion of any kind other than it's flying, which I don't consider that evasion. Cool, it's in the air, it's hard to block and it gains life, awesome. And then somebody hits it with a murder. But wait! Other angels you control get plus one, plus one and have lifelink. All ten of the angels that are legal and standard. Nine if you don't count Lyra herself. One of them's in the welcome deck, so that's a real gem. And the average converted mana cost of angels in standard right now is 4.8. Yes, guys, this is the number one card to build around. Wow. I mean, just the sheer power of it. I mean, I miss Aerial Responder and Gisela too, but not enough to, like, become delusional. She fits in some mono white and some mentor decks. Great. That's one of those, oh, look, Wizards built my deck for me decks. I mean, that's it's going to get a little bit more innovative by the Pro Tour. Let's just put it that way. So anyway, speaking of the Pro Tour, uh, the Guilds of Ravnica Mythic Edition, which is being sold basically at the Pro Tour, which is also now a GP. Although I don't remember if the very next one is doing that. Whatever, who cares? That segue was crap anyway. So besides Kevin losing his mind, what is up with this Mythic Edition and Wizards losing their minds? See, I knew there was a segue there somewhere. Um, you cannot get it currently on eBay cheaper than $624.99 US dollars. And that's the lowest listing, second lowest is $650. Then there's another one for $650, and then it goes right to $750. And it only gets worse from there. There's some $800s, and then there's some Lunu as it at uh, $4,500, plus $3.50 shipping. And I think the total for sale on eBay, like grand total right now is like 10. I mean, it's unbelievably low. So they're almost quite literally gone, just off the market completely and sold out the end where you just simply cannot buy one. Now it's hard to pin down an actual price of the Planeswalkers. They're really all over the place and it depends where you shop and the price keeps changing every day. But basically in general, if you add up the eight, you know, custom basically masterpiece planeswalkers, they add up to about 600 and some dollars. So it, it's basically, yeah, you're, you're getting actually better than what you're paying for at this point. You know, because you get like 24 boosters with it too, which are, you know, worth like an extra, what, 60, something like that. By the way, quick aside, um, you can't get Guilds of Ravnica boxes on eBay cheaper than 95 still. And this is like a week after release. That's pretty crazy. Some of the cards are going up as people develop decks and stuff, and all the major decks seem to be Guilds of Ravnica based, so it's looking pretty good. But back to this one, I mean, it's, it was a disaster. Everybody heard about, oh, you know, 
the, the site went down. Everybody warned people that the site was going to go down. Orders didn't really go through, but people were billed. They were billed multiple times. I think Jeremy uh, said that he has like five or six charges or something for like 500 bucks for two of them. Multiple on his credit card that still haven't been refunded. Ouch. The uh, Hasbro phone support staff was there for hours past the normal uh, quit time taking calls from everybody and I'm sure everybody was just pissed and venting their wonderful frustrations about how this went down to the staff that mans the phones that has absolutely nothing to do with the product or how it was sold. Angry MTG players and people who lost out on their opportunity to make a giant amount of money or get a product they really wanted, that's not who you want on the other end of the phone. They ain't going to be polite about it. Oh, and by the way, they're almost definitely not Hasbro employees. Almost every place like this will just outsource their um, their support calls to like a third-party call center. So that's even better, but it seems like the only way to really get one was either to show up in the first minute and cross your fingers that the site didn't freeze, or to call customer service, or I heard in some cases have them call you and just work it out, because like basically none of the purchases appeared to have gone through. And then they were just like handing out allocations based on who they called first, I guess. I, I don't know the exact inner workings of the process and how they made it fair. I just assume they kind of didn't. But yeah, anybody who stayed on hold for upwards of, I think, three or four hours was able to maybe eventually get through. And then if there was any left to go around, they'd like give you one. So what a fun idea. Now, everybody told them, hey, Hasbro, whenever you do something like this, your stupid site goes down and magic is pretty damn big. So this is what's going to happen. And then it happened. So whose idea was it to sell it there? And I'm going to guess not Wizards of the Coast because I would assume nobody there even really considers themselves like, oh, I'm a Hasbro team member. I'm a Hasbro employee. Like, Wizards of the Coast was always their own separate company until Hasbro came in and acquired them. And from what I've heard, it's mostly autonomous. It's just, hey, keep doing what you're doing. We acquired you because you made money and you're making more money every year, except for recently. You know, you do you and keep handing us the profits. Although I've heard rumors allegedly from like ex-employees and, you know, friends of friends and stuff that say that, no, Hasbro just pressures them a bit, kind of interferes with what they do. Like it's hands off, but at the end of the day, they're like, you've got to make more money. That's the rumor. So did Hasbro say, why are you selling through distributors who then take a cut, who sell it to store owners who then take a cut, and then to the end consumer for, oh, more than double what they're charging at the distributor level. So more than half of the money is not going to Wizards of the Coast for their own product. Did Hasbro take issue with that? And maybe they're looking at successful sets like Modern Masters 1 and others, you know, in the past, even BFZ to an extent for a while, <laughs> not in the long run. The singles were worth a ton, and it, it doesn't matter because Wizards doesn't see any of that money. So was Hasbro like, hey, sell singles? Because remember, they discontinued from the vault, which was them literally selling singles. I mean, there was zero variance in that product. They probably discontinued it because there was zero variance in the product. They were admitting that a playable card, even though a special edition, was valuable because they were selling it with no variance right now they can say the cards are worthless they have no actual market value yes people sell them to each other but people can sell anything you can sell like intangibles and stuff whatever the value that we're selling in a booster pack is is like the gambling aspect the randomization the fun of that the fun of opening it and the draftability and you know sealed and that kind of stuff Oh, but the cards, once they're open, they're worthless. If people want to sell them to each other, great, but we're not going to admit for legal reasons that they have a value because then it would be gambling and we would be looking at potential legal issues in certain countries. FYI, that's almost definitely why this uh, these eight Planeswalkers were mixed in with 24 boosters and they're put in boosters so that there's some randomization. Then they could say, oh no, those singles, we aren't selling singles because that would be admitting that they're worth, you know, X, 250 bucks or whatever. No, we're selling just packs with them in them. They're just special packs. It, it's the playability, the randomization. They even specifically mentioned draft. So they have enough plausible deniability to maybe make it through court if somebody tried to sue them saying, oh, well, you know, you're selling gambling and, and stuff worth money to miners and whatever. Because remember, there's very similar litigation going on right now in Europe with loot boxes where they're like, it's digital goods and, and the terms of service say you can't sell them because you don't own them. It's all property on our server. But you can take skins and sell them from CSGO on the open market. That is a thing that exists. And you don't have to be 18 to do it, which is an issue. So switch it to paper cards and admit they have value and, oh, you've got even more trouble. You're even less likely to win in court. 
So according to all the legal experts for the last, you know, 10, 20 years, they've been saying, yes, wizards will never admit that the secondary market exists or that singles are worth anything. That's why they carefully word everything. So that's why they developed the product the way they did, almost definitely, in my opinion. And like I said, Hasbro was probably the one saying, well, let's sell singles, make it legal. Okay, fine. You want to put it in this thing, mix it, whatever. And why don't we directly sell it? We have a market. We have an e-commerce site. We have our existing fulfillment system and our mailing system. Just use that. In fact, remember, Wizards had their own distribution system, warehouse fulfillment, all that, and they just terminated it. They said, we are going to stop selling singles directly to stores. You have to go through a distributor now. And that's probably because it's too darn expensive. It's too top heavy. There's too much overhead with that and labor and equipment and warehousing and insurance and you name it. But Hasbro ships out tons of stuff and they're not going to stop. So just hand it over to Hasbro. Like I said, I think that was Hasbro's idea. I don't think Wizards of the Coast was like, well, let's just shift it to Hasbro's wonderful toy shop. I think it was up to them. They would have sold it to distributors or direct WPN allocation or something like that. Something a little bit healthier and friendlier. And plus, Wizards doesn't run the toy portal site thing, website, whatever the hell it was. And I think they were made well aware of its stability issues by all of their uh, community members on Twitter and other social media. So I just can't imagine this being their idea. I think Hasbro was like, we need more money, we need to sell singles, find a way to do it, and we're going to sell it with our fulfillment thing. Or that was Wizards' idea, and they were like, well, I don't want to do this, but if we did do it, it would work, and we'd have a full margin on it. We wouldn't have to split the profits with anyone, really. Or do they? Let's go back to Modern Masters 1, where and this is pretty widely known. Once again, not confirmed. It's not like Wizards came out and admitted this. But word is, amongst the employees, they were very angry at what happened with Modern Masters 1, where they were selling the boxes for like, I don't even know, I think the packs were six ninety nine MSRP, so roughly like, what, 53% of that or whatever. Oh, and then the boxes were worth hundreds with an S. The packs and the singles were so damn much money that all the stores were buying them for, you know, X amount, like 90, 100 bucks. I don't know. I don't know what the cost was. Probably around there, though. And then they're selling them for what? Like 300? I mean, I don't know what the prices were. I wasn't even playing the game back then, but I've heard rumors that they were insanely high. And all the profits from that were going into the pockets of the secondary market, the stores, and the single sellers. And it was mostly stores, because remember, it was WPN allocation only back then. I believe that was the same for MM2, and then it ended. I remember getting a call about MM3, and he's like, how much do you want? I'm like, did you make a mistake and dial the wrong person? They're like, no, they're opening it up to all places. I'm like, I'll take $7,000 worth, thanks. I don't believe that's what they actually sent me, but that's what I ordered. So that was like, wow, we just burned up tons of value in the secondary market with the reprints by, you know, suppressing prices and just basically destroying value and potential future value. And they could have like printed more and they, you know, they could have charged more, which they did with the next one. I think they were so sore over that. It was basically like, oh my gosh, just never do this again. This is never happening again. Well, look at Mythic Edition. What the hell did they think was going to happen? They're 600 bucks and, and, and everybody on the secondary market is making money and they're not. So did they not see this coming? Did they not make enough? Um, did they know that the Hasbro site would be such a disaster and they'd get a little bit you know, pissed off that people could only get it if they're from Canada or the US? So they took... I don't know, I'll just say half, because that's probably what it was, half the product, and gave it to Channel Fireball to sell at the next couple GPs. I mean, if you didn't hear, they are doing that. That is what they're doing. So did they short it too hard by doing that, and the price never should have hit 600 Or did they just, they, they just didn't print enough, period? So, to me, it, this whole thing seems so suspicious, so abnormal so not what they would logically do so against how they do things in the past everything about it was just weird just plain and simple a little bit too weird so that's where the conspiracy theories come in and some of these are pretty spicy so theory number one and i guarantee they're not going to be two three four five six i don't take notes of what the numbers are and i usually lose count but the first theory is um these were printed for something else. And I'm going to say something else in general. I've heard all different stories. Uh, Hascon and then it was canceled. I don't know. I guess that's a thing. 
These are supposed to be sold there. Maybe some kind of con, maybe San Diego Comic Con, except not because they sold other products there. Maybe it was that toy convention and they just printed too many, too few, couldn't get them done in time. I, I, it could have been just anything, or this could have been a giveaway. This could have been a WPN allocation only promo and then they changed their mind about it. But basically, it doesn't matter what the circumstances necessarily, just these were supposed to be sold somewhere else and then they weren't. Or not even necessarily sold, they were supposed to be used somewhere else. And that makes perfect sense. I mean, they're just like, how do we get rid of these? Ah, uh, crap, we don't have a SKU, we can't send it to distributors. How are distributors going to make it fair? There's not enough to go around. Screw it, let's just throw it up on the Hasbro site. The people will buy them and it'll be a disaster, but we'll get our money out of it. You know, it's better than sending them to the incinerator. And I've got to say, that explains a lot. And I mean a lot. It fills in an awful lot of the why for all of this. Why was it sold then? Why was it the way it was? Why was it the price it was? All of that stuff. Why would Wizards even attempt something like this when they knew damn well that it would be very negative backlash? It's because they already had it. Everything supports this except for one simple fact. You look at the San Diego Comic-Con um, uh, promo cards or whatever that they've sold in the past. They were just promo cards, straight up. These are in boosters, and then in the box, there's, I think, like 24 other boosters, or including the eight. Uh, who cares? I'm not buying one. I didn't look that close at the contents, because I ain't getting one, you know what I mean? Why would they add the extra vanilla, you know, regular boosters to the product? To, to make it heavier, harder to ship, more expensive? Why would anybody want any of that if these were supposed to be some kind of promo sold at some kind of con? And that really is the deal breaker for me on this conspiracy theory. I'm not saying it's the end all and it's no, that that's it. That's the end of this. But it really doesn't make sense except for the legal issues of directly selling singles. Because remember, uh, besides the last San Diego Comic-Con products, they're done with From the Vault. Um, they replaced it with Jace, which is semi-random. Or the Spellbook series, I should say. They're trying to randomize everything, and I think it's for legal and for loot box gambling secondary market value reasons. I really do. So maybe they were going to sell this at some con as is with the boosters. That was the point all along. That was the intention. And then they'd hide behind, oh, boosters, it's random, yay, and also it's a draft experience. We're selling a draft experience. This is a draft box. Because they really stress the whole draft thing in, in the literature. So I think there's more evidence for this being sort of an accident, and then they just decided to get rid of it because they couldn't use it where they originally wanted to. There's more evidence for that than against it, but I just can't get past why they'd add in boosters other than that legal thing, which is an explanation. So if you believe that, then okay, there's... No reason to believe that this wasn't just a whoops last second thing. So that really begs the question, will they do it again? So theory number probably two. Wizards wants to start selling singles, or Hasbro wants them to, because singles are guaranteed money. If it's a random set or it's a collection of singles, also known as, you know, a set, a reprint set, whatever... Not everybody wants to open it, and there's some variance there. I mean, not on a large scale. That's why I think this is kind of, it, it doesn't really make sense to me. Because, I mean, a palette of Guilds of Ravnica, they're selling you singles. There's exactly the same number of singles on that uh, palette if you open it all up and sort them. So from their perspective, they're still selling you singles, but if they're directly selling you singles, then they know exactly what the singles are worth, what they can sell it for, or whatever. It's not like the price on this went up or down, and they're charging less than the singles are worth on the market. But this is the first run. I mean, did they even get MM1 correct on the first run? No, they drastically underpriced it and put too much value in it. So assuming they just basically screwed it up, they knew what these would approximately be worth, and they priced it accordingly. And if they sold it for 500 you know people would be losing their damn minds. 250 is still no small chunk of change, but you know, people buy things for 250. Like, you want to go shoot archery? <laughs> 250 is low for a bow. Fishing? Yeah, you're going to spend 250. Paintball? You're going to spend 250. I mean, mountain biking? You're going to be in for a little more than 250. But 500 for something that has no intrinsic, inherent value other than maybe people kind of wanting it, not very smart. I think they would have caught a lot more crap about that. So the whole, oh, Wizards doesn't want to sell packs, they don't want to sell sealed stuff, because once it becomes unattractive and not mathematically sound to open them on a large scale and then resell the singles, like once the box EV hits 100, people are not going to pay, you know, 80 a box and then open them and ship them. That, that, that $20 margin is gone, you'd be losing money at that point. So then people stop buying them, whereas these, it's like, okay, they know what they're worth, it's, it's a unique uh, product that uh, the cards, the singles, the planeswalkers that you can't get anywhere else, which isn't completely true. I mean, these are all reprints. It's just this version of it you can't get anywhere else. 
they already know there's not enough to go around. So if they print it off another thousand, another two thousand, another three thousand, it's probably not going to drop. So it's not like they're going to hit the wall where they're like, okay, nobody wants Amon Ket anymore. Nobody wants Six Land anymore. We can't sell them past even the initial wave because it was just so poor a value and nothing could compete with energy. That always was the problem with both of those releases. That and the other half of the cards you needed to build literally anything from those decks was in the second set in the block. You can't build vehicles with half vehicles, could never build energy with half the energy. You can't build dinosaurs with half the dinosaurs missing. It, it, it doesn't work that way. So they've obviously already fixed that by getting rid of two-part sets. But um, when it comes to singles, you don't have to open them and say, oh, but what about all these you know, 90% dead cards that are worth under a dollar dragging it down? Now people don't want to buy it anymore. But if it's just the same eight cards and people still want the eight cards, you can sell it until those go down. And there's a lot less variance because... I mean, special edition and printed at probably one one hundredth the volume of a standard set, it's safe to say almost no matter how many you print, there's not enough to go around. So you can count on that value being what it is. They, In other words, even though these were, you know, $500 on day one on eBay, that's, that's great. That, that's what they expected. They can keep selling them for $250 forever. Now, obviously, there is a point where people would stop buying them. Uh, people would just, there wouldn't be enough customers left. But I think they knew that within reason they're not going to hit that number. So they could just be like, pop off another 250 off the printer for, you know, $5 in paper and ink or whatever. Oh, another 250 another 250 another 250 So I guess in theory that might be true. That eight ultra-rare singles that you can only get from that one product can go a lot longer than a standard product, especially if it's dead on arrival. Now you look at like Dominaria, which held its value for at least a couple weeks, which now it's like, what, $60, $70 EV? But this all counts on, well, conspiracy theory number three, which is that they, they're going to print this again. And I don't mean Ravnica Allegiances or whatever the next one's called, uh, Mythic Edition. I mean literally this. Now, would it make sense to sell, you know, Guilds of Ravnica Mythic Edition uh, three months from now after the release of the next set? That would be quite stupid. But then again, this was the trial, so maybe they'll do triple the volume next time and call it, you know, Allegiance Mythic Edition. So for it to be true that they wanted to maintain the $250 price, they knew that they could count on it, they could just pocket the money all day and not have to lose half of it to a distributor or a store. That was the point. It was a cash grab, even at this incredibly low print volume, which we don't have a number, but I mean, come on, how high could this possibly be? But it only works. It's like, okay, it's, it's at $600, $700 market value. Let's print some more. That only works if they can print some more. I mean, I think that... They knew they were going to sell out at the initial numbers, so why care about, oh, if, if we were to run off more in the future, we could continue to sell them for 250 for a longer period of time. It doesn't matter if you don't actually do it. So I think theory number two will be true if theory number three happens, which is that they're going to immediately get a giant supply of these done again at the printers. And remember, the lead time is approximately, give or take, like, eh, probably to, to really get on the shelves or have it in their warehouse from order time, eh, three to five weeks, I'd say. Depends how busy the printers are and, you know, shipping times, that kind of stuff, but right around there. Well, let's see, where would that take us? Hmm, that would drop us right in the middle of Christmas shopping season. Hmm, have they ever taken an ultra-high value set, made more of it, allegedly, and then sold it during Christmas as, like, a Christmas thing? Why, yes, they did. It was called Eternal Masters. Hmm, I seem to distinctly remember that. So if you buy the fact that they weren't just shorting the first one because they put too much crap in it, they didn't put enough good cards in it, so they wanted to artificially short the supply, and then boxes were like 270 like a week after release, and then they released the, the rest that were still in the warehouse. Or if you think, well, that was enough weeks that they could have gotten it printed, which is true. That is true, by the way. It was enough time if they're like, oh my god, these boxes are 270 and we need to run off more of these. And then they drove it into the ground by getting a little too aggressive on the reprint, which <laughs> wasn't even that big. But, I mean, the market couldn't absorb that many more. Remember, people don't play Legacy and Vintage and they play Commander, but not that many cards in Eternal Masters uh, were for Commander. So, if you believe that Wizard said, oh my god, Eternal Masters is Modern Masters 1 all over again... We don't care that we called this a limited print run set. We didn't clearly define that or assure anybody of anything or enter any into any kind of like written or verbal contract. Make some more. If that's what they did, it'll be interesting to see if they do it again is what I'm saying. 
And that would support the theory that, um, you know, instead of just, oops, we're stuck with these. How can we get rid of these? I don't know. Sell them. Put them on Hasbro's website. Whatever. Just get rid of them. It was just a fluke, an accident, a one-time thing, a, a poorly thought-out thing because it, it literally wasn't thought out. But if they do a reprint, you know they're not going to print off more of them when people are already pissed that this even exists. They want to put it behind them if it was just, whoops, accident, ditch them. But if this was all about money and selling people singles because now they want to directly sell people valuable singles... If they do a second run of these and we hear about it, because they could just give Channel Fireball an extra thousand and say, eh, don't tell anybody. Yeah, it's a second print run. Just pretend that's the amount you had in the first place and sell them at a Grand Prix. So assuming it's public and we hear about it, I think that would really confirm the no, this was about money. This was not a mistake. This was money. This was on purpose. So the fourth theory that, that also ties to this is... Um, and I've been saying this, and this is why I don't think it, it, it's that bad of a product. I mean, it is a bad product. It, it's greedy. It's stupid. People hated it. It was a bad move corporate-wise. The way they distributed it was idiotically stupid. The whole thing was a disaster, but let's just say some people really sucked at planning it, but this was intentional. This was not an accident. In other words, they didn't just get stuck with this. They were like, no, let's design this and sell it. Did someone at Wizards or Hasbro finally say... We need the whales. We need the collectors. We need the rich players, the rich people. Okay, we need their money because, and, and this is where it starts to really make sense. That's why I think this is the most plausible to me personally. You look at a mobile game, who gets you 85 to 90% of the income? It's the whales who have tons of money or not a lot of sense or both. People with severe mental defects, basically, some kind of, you know, obsessive type of issues. Addictive personalities, low self-esteem, whatever, you know, you know the type of people they take advantage of, and it's it's honestly disgusting to me. Or just people who have $10 million, they're just like, I don't care, drop 500 bucks on this, I just bought a painting that costs five grand, I mean, who cares? That's who they need to be paying them tons of money. You know why? Because they have lots of money. I'd say, within reason, because this isn't completely true, a rich person playing magic and a poor person playing magic, they both can spend the same amount, and, and that's that. Basically, there's no way for somebody to pay lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of money and play magic unless they foil out their entire deck. And who does that? Foils curl. I mean, you wouldn't even want that. I did it once and I kind of regret it because the whole damn thing curled. It was Gravity Bomb, by the way. Oh, and FYI, Wizards doesn't get any of that money. You got to buy those foils in the secondary market. So the best somebody can do is say, screw it, I don't want to buy singles. I'm above that. I'll buy two cases and virtually guarantee myself four of every mythic. I think that would actually still short it. So that's still only them giving Wizards, and remember, there's there's the store owner and the distributor cut. It, it's not even giving Wizards more than a couple hundred dollars. Why are they not taking advantage of the collector mindset, the collector people? And just remember, like, there's Amiibo collectors out there. There's, like, old game collectors, people who want one of every Xbox game that existed. People buy collector's editions of games so that they can get the cool statues of the swag and the t-shirt and all that stuff. People who got money want to give you money, and like I said... Doesn't matter who you are, or what your background is. If you want to build X deck in in standard MTG, you're gonna spend X on it. It doesn't matter. You can't spend more. Rule number one of business when it comes to something stupid, anyway, because nobody, you know, you don't eat the cards. You don't need the cards to live. It's a very luxury item that nobody needs. So if that already is your category, you need to have a way for people to dump money into it if they have it. What's the old saying? We need to find the customers with disposable income and make them dispose of it to us so at the end of the day what they needed was high-end expensive elite ultra rare collectibles it needs to be collectible and remember they were stressing besides the draft thing which as if anybody would ever play with these are you kidding me these are collectibles just like the j spellbook thing i mean they're they're you could play with them it's a cheap enough product but still they're supposed to really be collectible same with from the vault I think those cards are actually heavier than standard cards. There's no reason they should be standard legal, but they just say that they are so that you have more of a reason to buy with them. Because just think, if you couldn't play with these eight Planeswalkers, you think they'd be $600? And look at other markets. I mean, you get uh, something that's like an oversized special print, ultra high quality, made with ultra premium stuff for some special paper, or that, you know, they've got for the sports cards a piece of the person's actual jersey in the card or they had the the person sign the card with an actual marker themselves personally hey they sold that jace token and that thing was made out of uh what was it like one or two ounces of solid silver and then printed on top 
Oh, okay, that is some I'm rich show off collectible stuff. And people bought those like crazy. It, it, it wasn't the most successful product ever because I think they uh, they made a couple too many for what the market was. And they were a little bit too expensive compared to the value of the silver. But still, I mean, you look them up now, they ain't exactly cheap and there's not a lot floating around and people are starting to kind of want them. So it's not a terrible investment necessarily. They were also numbered. You had an individual like serial number and they only made like a thousand. So you know that you know this is it. It's all these gimmicky tricks that they use for other products that are similar to this. So I think they were just like, okay, borderless, because that's super rare and people love that. Um, some of the most powerful cards ever printed, famous characters, uh, super limited print run. They added up all these things. They're like, what else could we do? They honestly should have just had them all signed by the artist with, with a, like a marker. And who knows, in the future they might. I mean, they could do anything they wanted to make these be the elite, look what I have, show off items, because that attracts the rich people who like to show off. It's really that simple. So if somebody at Hasbro Wizards was like, we need to get into that market, what do we do? Or even just in general, we need to make more money, what do we do? Well, design standard better and stop driving people away with control draw shutdown bullshit. Well, no, I guess we're not going to stop doing that because R&D and card design are the worst people at their jobs at the entire company. I mean, if, if you design too good of a set, you know, energy, basically, just the energy archetype, the next four sets are going to sell like crap because nothing can beat it and people want the best. So after dead set, after dead set, after dead set, and remember M25, my vendor never sold out of the first wave. They probably still have some now. If that happens, Wizards loses a ton of money and that's their standard core product. So if they can't control the demand for that, they're going to bring back core sets. I know some will sell well, some won't, but they're like, okay, we can't have this up and down. We need something that we know will sell well. Hit the collectible premium market. That's what you do. Now, other people said, well, then bring masterpieces back. One, they went away because they ran out of worthwhile cards to print. They even admitted that themselves. And then two, um, I don't know if you know how math works, but BFZ didn't sell for more. Wizards didn't say, oh, this contains masterpieces, so we're going to charge 10 bucks more per box. They kept the price the same. When you keep the price the same, people are going to open it until it's not worthwhile, which means that at the end of the day, it just pushed down the prices of standard by about 19%, and then 19% of the value was the masterpieces. So the box is actually worth the same exact amount of money because you paid the same amount of money for it. If you're going to add a premium feature, you have to charge more for it or it doesn't work. It just pushes the other cards down. So what do you do? You release masterpieces, ultra rare, ultra elite, ultra expensive cards, but sell them as singles. But don't make it look like you're selling singles because that might be illegal in some countries. Make them technically playable cards, make them ultra rare, ultra pretty, everything else they did, but then sell them basically direct to the consumer. And here's the thing, everybody complaining about this, saying this is terrible, they're so greedy, I hate them, oh, how am I supposed to get this? Let me remind you, and hopefully this is the last time I have to say it, and just saying it now, I already know it's not. Repeat after me. I do not need Guilds of Ravnica Mythic Edition Planeswalkers to play the game. I do not need those eight cards in order to play Magic. Any format. There are cheaper alternatives that are more intended to be played in actual decks. There's more of them to go around, and they're like seven times cheaper. Not one single person on planet Earth needs these cards, period, but then needs these cards to play the game either. They are the definition of a collectible. Wanting something and needing something are two completely different things. Nobody needs this. Nobody requires this. So complain all you want about the gift pack that's coming up where it's $20 MSRP and you get five cards that are standard legal where if you want them, that's the only place you can get them. That's a load of crap, okay? That's just, uh, what do they call it? Not gatekeeping or walling, paywalling? I don't know, Yu-Gi-Oh! players have a term for this because they've been doing that for years in Yu-Gi-Oh! But yeah, you want the Planeswalker card on the front of the Planeswalker decks? You gotta buy the Planeswalker deck. Want the really good angel from the gift pack? Guess you're gonna have to buy the gift pack. I mean, or buy the angel on the singles market, but you know, that's not the point. The point is, someone somewhere had to buy the gift pack and then sell you the card. It, 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 at the end of the day, Wizards got the money for the gift pack. They got the money for that angel. That is a dick move because now you do need that product in order to play standard if that's the deck you wanted to build. That is unacceptable. So that's why I say the gift pack and what they did to it and the Planeswalker decks and what they did to that, if you need the front card or the unique rares in it, that's it. You buy that, you can't get that from boosters. Sorry, you're going to have to buy this additionally. That's why I would say that those products are worse than Guilds of Ravnica Mythic Edition because that affects every single player who needs those cards. And nobody needs these to play the game. 
It's really that simple, so let me just widen out the scope again and reiterate what I was saying. You're sitting in the Magic the Gathering board meeting or whatever, the planning meeting. We didn't make more money. What do we do? Well, it worked pretty well when we sold people stuff, you know, at a premium stuff, like another tier up, another rarity up, a special edition, but make sure that nobody needs to give us money. We don't want to force the players to give us more money because we're already getting backlash for that. We don't want to make the game less approachable and more expensive to play for everybody. Yes, that would work in the short term. They'd give us more money, but people would also have higher incentive to just simply quit the game. So what do we do? Let's make this other thing and sell it to them. Something that nobody needs, but people are going to want. They're going to want it. They're going to buy it but everybody knows that they don't need it so they'll complain slightly less about it and if you look at the backlash it was the number they printed the price they sold it at and the site crashing those are the big complaints not oh these exist and i want them but that's mean no people know a collectible when they see it okay it, it's a premium collectible like i i see cars that i can't afford all the time doesn't mean i don't want them but i also acknowledge that i'm not magically somehow entitled to it just because it exists and i want it I mean, everybody wants Alpha and Beta dual lands, but guess what? There's cheaper ones that were printed later in higher volumes. I mean, you don't walk into your LGS and look at the front case and be like, oh, that's an Alpha dual land for, I don't know, a grand, two grand? Literally sitting right next to like a revised or unlimited one or something for like a couple hundred. And they're like, that's so unfair that that costs two grand. It's the same damn cards right in front of your face. You want, you want to play with it? You want to put it in a deck? Buy the cheaper one, dumbass. And that's what I would have to say about all of Guilds of Ravnica Mythic Edition. Then buy the cheaper one. You have no right to complain that you, you can't get the more expensive premium one. Who cares? The other one is just as good. It's just a little bit less pretty. If you just want pretty and you're not even going to use it, then you're a collector. Collectors fork over money. That's what they do. That's what makes the collection special. If you could pick up all these cards for $4 total, then everybody would have them and it wouldn't be special. You wouldn't even be a collector. You'd just be a purchaser so i think they were like what's the safest way to make money let's just make a premium option and for 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 uh safety reasons or whatever let's just sell it directly basically as singles and mask it by putting it in a couple boosters make it in semi-blind and that's why i don't have a problem with the idea of this i thought they should have made ultra premium anything years ago they were missing out on that whole collector market but right now, if you're an MTG collector, you're buying 100% from the secondary market and Wizards is seeing none of it. Oh, I want a complete set of beta, one of every card. Okay, wonderful. The Wizards get zero. I want one of every foil from Guilds of Ravnica. Okay, cool. You're probably not going to open boxes direct from Wizards until you get it. You're just going to buy it from the secondary market. Who, okay, buys it from Wizards, but still. There's a layer there, there's some time, there's a profit margin, and the boxes don't change in price based on the foil cost. So the math of it falls apart. So they said, we got to get these collectors and people willing to drop thousands on the game just because they have it. We need to get them to pay us money. And they did it. So I think we're going to see this again if the first theory is incorrect, that it wasn't just like an accident or a fluke. And you know, I would even try just to get people off your backs even more, not having playable versions. Like I said, print them on gold leaf plated. I don't know what would be expensive. Like, not iron, not zinc. I'm trying to think what else you could... Well, you wouldn't even have to electroplate it, honestly. You know, gold leaf isn't even that much more expensive than electroplating. Eh, hell, go with the old classic that I always say. Print it directly on silver. Like I said, they did it for those Jace token things. Hell, just do all the tokens that are in standard right now, one of each on a thin plate of a quarter ounce of silver and sell the whole damn thing for like 400 bucks. People who want to whip out their baller ass, you know, clunk it when it drops on the table tokens that are virtually indestructible and printed with die sub printing, so it probably ain't going to wash off. You'll sell that to people who just want to look all fancy and crap, you know? And okay, I guess the tokens would be playable because anything could be a token, but once again, you don't need them. You don't even need the real tokens. You could use Skittles for all they care. I think they should have done ultra, 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 ultra premium stuff a long time ago. And by the way, there's another example of them moving in this direction. And it's uh, WizKids, which I assume is just Wizards Kids. I don't think it's a third party. Too lazy to check. They're finally doing what I told them to uh, years ago. I'm, I'm sure they took the advice directly from me and solely from me. They're selling little miniatures, like basically D&D figurines of tokens that are in standard right now. Finally, finally, finally. And plus, they fit in the same tackle box as the uh, as the uh, dice do. So, I mean, I travel around with my dice and my miniatures for D&D in the same damn container. In fact, I mean, I'm sure you've seen it. People that I know have been using goblin miniatures from D&D for goblin tokens in Magic the Gathering because it's three-dimensional, brings it to life, it's all painted, and it looks cool as hell. 
So nobody needs that product, but will they buy it? Sure. And then you got the Ultra Pro Life Counters, which sold like crazy. They were functional, showy, pretty, kind of collectible, very limited edition. Some of them were foil. That was cool. But nobody needed them. You could use a pencil and paper. Nobody actually needed them, but they had a practical use. Those sold insanely well. So I think with this pattern of everything they're doing and everything they're licensing and all this stuff, I think they are moving towards we need to get money from the rich whales. And not even just crazy millionaires. I mean, just people who make enough money and have some money around. You know, a lot of people like me can barely afford to play the game. We build like $30 decks and then that's it. But some people who make, you know, 50, 60, 70 grand a year, they probably got some disposable income. So if they see some cool thing for five, 10 bucks, they're going to buy it. Or maybe even if they're a hardcore collector, they'd be like, oh, these, these Planeswalker cards, I want this one. It's 50 bucks. Eh, 50 bucks, you know. That's not that much money to them. And, and boy, would they look cool with it. It's, it's, you know, an ego show off thing. That's pretty much how all collectors are. So I think I believe basically theory two through four where it's, it's all, yeah, they did it on purpose. They're going to reprint it. And it was all knowing it was planned. It's part of a corporate move and hooray for the whales. I, I really think that's what it is. I don't think it was just a mistake and they tried to ditch it. Although if we never see this again, I probably would move towards that because I, I hate calling this a success, <laughs> but it's sold and it's worth money and they're currently out of them. So I guess it was a success. There is the backlash, but when has Wizards of the Coast ever cared about public image? I mean, even their D&D books fell apart because the binding was glued on wrong. There's typos on the cards. Half their staff is mouthing off on Twitter and yelling at people about being white or whatever. They just don't give a crap about their image anymore, it would seem. So if people want to call them greedy and decry this as the worst product ever and, you know, just absolutely lambast them on, on social media, they don't care. They're used to it. So it all comes down to, do we see a second run of these? Do we see them sell them again around Christmas? And do we see a different version of it in the future? That will answer a lot of our questions. And in the meantime, don't count on those answers from wizard staff because you're not going to get them. So what do you think about this whole situation? Is there any evidence supporting any one of these sides of the argument, the theory, any of that? Is, is there another take on this, another possibility? Leave that down in the comment section below. Otherwise, thanks for watching and I will see you guys next time Wizards does some crazy shit. In other words, really soon.